going on guys? This is Gil from IPGRentals.com. What you see in front of me here is the Cinegear R28 CRC 4x4 vehicle. They sent us this to see what it was really made of, so we put this thing through the ringer. Let's check it out. So that's the first look at the Cinegear CRC R28 4x4 vehicle. I'm Gil and this is Chris. We got to take this baby out on the road and you got to see what it can do. I was running the Grimble, he was running the car. And since you got the driver first, let's hear what your thoughts were. So uh, we have to talk about this straight out of the box. Take a look at this thing. I mean, it's, 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 it's like a tank and it's, it's, as a kid, and we're all just big kids, <laughs> I wanted this under my tree every single oh, year. So, so having it arrive in a, in a nice Christmas box for us was fantastic. So we put it together. It really, it was already programmed and ready to go. Um, we just did some slight little variations to the controller, how it handled, and we took it straight outside. Um, and we went through some pretty rough terrain, some good rocks, and uh, as you saw from that, that B-roll in the beginning, uh, it handled it really, really, really well. So the next step, let's throw a camera on it, let's put it right back out there on that rough terrain and see what we can do. But the results, understandably, on that kind of terrain were a little bit, a little bit rocky uh, for the gimbal. And like you said, Gil was operating the gimbal, so what do you think about it? Adding the weight of the gimbal, you notice it affected the steering of the vehicle itself. So definitely, just from it panning and tilting and, and just the momentum of the car moving and the gimbal going back. So it definitely created a different type of resistance for the vehicle and for the gimbal itself. Um, so there was some balancing and terrain issues that needed to be figured out. So once we did that, um, we ended up going to a lighter terrain and uh, making some adjustments on the controller and the car itself and this is what we got. So that was our test that we did on a very level surface and that's been put through our editing software with some stabilization to it. We were able to get it fairly, very smooth using a stabilizer with not too much a stabilizer added. You can see, uh, we'll do a side by side right here, you can see here's the initial footage on the left and you can see a slight bit of sway to it and then on the right side you see it stabilized. So definitely. Uh, I would say better than salvageable. I would say it's definitely usable for sure for a very smooth and a very unique look from such a low angle. Obviously you see that sway and I don't think that that sway was necessarily the gimbal. I think a lot of it had to do with the dampering pads that are in between the two plates. Because of the weight of those, the, the weight that was on those, it was causing them to shift, which was causing this plate right here to shift. When that happened, obviously the the Ronin would have to try to counterbalance it, which was causing the shake. Um, and in that as well, you encountered issues with steering. Yes, there was, there was, and again, this, we're not IC guys, uh, second disclaimer there, but as far as I could tech out this controller, I put it through to where there was, there was no pulling, there was no favoring to one side or the other, but it seemed like when, when it got moving, and it got moving pretty, pretty, you know, at 10 or 15 miles per hour, it seemed like it would always kind of give me a direction to the left or a direction to the right. Now, again, we've kind of teched it out as far as we could kind of safely, because yeah, as far as we know how, there might be better options to, to lock your steering down better, um, but it seemed like I had to make micro adjustments that threw off you know, what he was doing for the gimbal. So uh, you can see in some of this footage, you'll see, you know, tiny little moves that I had to do left and right to, to make sure I was on the path. And the path was pretty straight. Yeah, you know? and, and that's the thing is with those little jolts or moves that were necessary, it caused the Ronin to have to counterbalance itself automatically, which then affected my tilts or my pans uh, from being as smooth or stopping where I wanted it to stop. So that was definitely, so I feel the issue from that was the dampering pads, the rubber ones that are in between the two plates. I feel like if they have a higher grade or a higher test of those, that will eliminate a lot of the issue that uh, 
we're using for that. Right, and I think also when you put it on a very fixed object like this that you're gonna see, you know, has motion like this, you're gonna be able to see that because the Ronin can't stabilize that. So that's where, like you said, that these dampeners uh, and these this uh, steel filament and even the the shocks and the springs that it needs to if it's if it's not better it just needs to be more adjustable yeah or a little higher higher grade as well exactly um, another thing we noticed that during the running shot that you saw that was actually the car moving forward and I had the Ronin faced backwards in reverse and did the tilt we noticed surprisingly which we weren't expecting we didn't do that way on purpose but we realized that because of the balance of the weight being of the camera and the lens and everything being in the back end, plus the front end having its own weight, it actually seemed to handle a little bit better. Handle better and it was much more stable. And it was, yeah, it was a much more stable I shot. Love. I was able to do to unpan a lot easier. And so, surprisingly enough, there was no stabilization on those shots where I was going Not straight backwards, not at all, none. We noticed that having the larger, heavier camera, which is the footage that you see that's the better footage, um, created a much more uh, smooth, elegant shot compared to the A7S. I think there's a give and take with that. I think there's a, it created more stability, but I think it made the sway worse because of the physics of it. Because of, so you have such a heavier weight up here, it still is gonna give you that sway, but it's gonna give it a nice amount of I weight. See, so with the A7S, even though the footage is going crazy like this, you see it going like this, you don't see it going like this. So I think that it's a so pro and a con. there needs to be a balance. Exactly. Somewhere there needs to be a balance yeah. between the, whether it's readjusting the center of, of where the Ronin sits, because right now they have it setting center on the plate. Um, maybe if you're running a Ronin with a lighter camera, you have it more towards the back or more towards the front, depending on where the weight is balanced. And that's, you know, having that accessibility, I think will make a big difference. True. Uh, let's talk about the remote. Uh, this is the, the key instrument here to, to making this thing uh, smooth and the shot smooth. Um, and I have to say it was, it was kind of a, a mixed relationship for sure. Um, I feel like that the remote had enough, uh, enough menu driven options in order to make it, you know, customizable. You can, you can set the speed, uh, uh, you can cap it, you can adjust your steering, you can reverse the settings and stuff like that. But what I feel like it's not the best quality. Um, I feel like it's, it's a universal remote for a lot of remote controlled cars um, and I feel like when you see some other, other gimbal cars out there, their remotes are like this big uh, and they have you know, six different switches and it's very sensitive and I had a, a trigger and this trigger is so sensitive and you can adjust it but it's just, if you, if you turn, you know, your finger's gonna move a little bit and I, I wish it was more something where it was, it was a, uh, more of a joystick rather than a trigger. And another issue that we were having with the trigger being so sensitive was a jolting motion whenever the vehicle would start, which in return would cause a, an effect on the, the gimbal. So what we did was we had the car start moving before the subject would and then have the subject basically catch up to it. And we noticed that that gave it a smoother start so that way you didn't have to see that jolting motion. Did you find that that was... Absolutely, and I think on the back end too, like when you were finishing up a shot, you know, when if the car would stop, you know, the, the yeah. gimbal, it's, it's trying to counteract that sharp motion when you, when you also are wrapping up a shot. Definitely good to hold that shot through past the point where you edit it because again, you know, when it does stop, the gimbal is trying to counteract. And I also do wish that on the trigger, when you, you ease it in, it doesn't quite ease from nothing to something. It, it, it gives you a kind of a jolt to get it started. So um, I do wish that there was a bit more of an easement uh, to it. Yeah, you know? definitely like a pattern. One thing that we can both agree on, um, and everybody that worked with the car with us, is that the battery life is very well. I mean, we had two batteries. You can run it on one or two, um, but we did it on two. And with the weight and, and the way we were driving it, we got close to 40 minutes. Sure, sure. I mean, it's, it's something very important to remember that, that 40 minutes doesn't seem like a lot, but you have to see what you're doing to it and all the weight you're putting on it, the start stop, you know, maintaining a good speed. So 40 minutes is good. I mean, we know, you yeah. know. Look we, at drones. I mean, with drones, drones that we have, we get 10 minutes, 15 minutes on them. Exactly. And, and so, uh, and, and you know, the charger, it, it wasn't bad as well. It was relatively easy to figure out. But the one problem was when these batteries got drained to a very, very low level, the battery charger would not even recognize it to start charging, it would say low voltage. So you had to throw it into another mode, not LiPo, in order to get it up to a certain level. 
and then from there you had to switch it back to LiPo and then charge it back up. So the time wasn't bad for charging it. It was between 30 minutes and an hour to charge it, but the fact that you had to come back to it, what if you're on set? What if you forget about it yeah. and you're charging it up in a mode that it's not supposed to charge it up? So if, off your knowledge, how long did it take you to do the light, the pre-LiPo to? Uh, it was about uh, between five and 10 minutes per, uh, per battery. And then from there, how long would it take to charge? Probably about 30, 45 minutes from so there. about an hour. About an hour, about yeah. an hour to charge. So you get 40 minutes of use and an hour of charge, which in reality isn't that bad, no, um, especially with everything that's going on through it. So that's definitely one thing. And we, even with the remote, we put double A's in it and it's that's, lasted, it's still going, yeah. that's, I don't even think it's even gone down at all. So yeah. that's another, it gives you some, one less thing to worry about. So that's definitely a pro to it itself as a vehicle and a remote. I would say definitely buy multiple batteries though. Yeah. Um, it comes with two. If you're gonna use this heavy duty for an entire day of shooting, I would say there's no number of batteries that you yeah, shouldn't you have. have. You know, you can never have too yeah. many batteries. So wherever your cost efficiency, you know, is cost is if it's cost efficient to you, but I would definitely say, you know, you don't want to sit there while talent is waiting for your batteries to charge up. So definitely I would say more than two would definitely be a good option. So we talked about a lot of things, um, but kind of the grassroots, the base thing looking at this is, is the build of it, the, the quality of it. Um, you know, the openness of it. So, so Gil, I gotta ask you, what do you think about the overall build of it? By the looks of it, you can definitely tell it is a rough, tough machine. Um, like we said before, it looks like something that can go into battle. The only downfall for me that I really came across of, I mean, obviously, yes, it's tough and durable. You're not gonna wanna run into the walls or anything like that. My biggest concern is the openness of everything. Again, we're not RC guys, so that might be the standard, but I noticed, like, for example, the fan in the back is open all the wires and cables exposed. So my concern being, I mean, it collected dust and dirt just going through a field. Over time, is that stuff going to eventually start damaging those things? Or even, you know, post rain, if there's puddles on the ground or if you're going through grass and it's not raining but the grass is wet, is that gonna shorten things out because everything's so exposed? Um, obviously we didn't test that because we didn't want to damage it, um, but I'm just using common sense and knowledge tells me that that probably wouldn't be the best idea, so. Yeah, I mean, in, in just first looks, I mean, we, we've had this thing for, you know, about a week now, and just through the, we put it through the ringer kind of the first little bit, but just kind of the basic use we've been doing it, you can see that some of the some of the rims are a little bit, the rims are plastic to begin with, yeah. um, which which I think could be part, a little bit problematic because if, if you compromise the structure, inside here, does that mean that the wheel's not gonna sit perfectly on it um, or cracks or anything like that? So uh, as far as the wheels go, which are gonna be you know, one of the most important parts, if one of your wheels is, is broken, you're not going anywhere. So overall, let's, what do you think? Let's rate this puppy? Yeah. All right. There are some things um, that I feel you might or should go in different avenues to do, to accomplish. Because there are some, you know, some things about, you know, God forbid, um, you know, this thing, you know, it turns or maybe something goes haywire and, and you know, it turns into a talent or it turns into a vehicle or something like that. Um, I just feel like in some applications, it could be a little bit dangerous, but of course you want to be fluent in your knowledge of it as well, you know. What applications do you think in your, in your opinion would be best for this? I think kind of what we did. That's a very interesting narrative kind of angle that we got. You know, that low shot looking at the bike as, as, as the person was going, um, you know, it, it, it made you feel kind of peaceful in a way, you know, kind of like it wasn't just the standard person's eye line walking, it was showing the trees, it was showing the sky. So I think that anything that kind of calls for that low angle or POV stuff, I mean, you know, what, what if you, you, you take the flaws of it, you know, being a little bit shaky on, on harder terrains, that could be the, the eyes of the beast, or that could be, you know, kind of someone tracking really quickly after, because again, you're not running perfectly yeah. still, it's you're running, dog, exa dog, exactly. Like what I do feel like it, it, it trips up on a little bit is um, any application where you can't really set the shot perfectly and you don't have chances to redo it. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely did take us a couple times to get those shots yeah. because of the issues we were having before that we talked about. Now let me ask you this, um, when it, one thing we didn't really talk about, but we should address now that we're rating it, is speed. It's, it's fast. fast. Oh, it's fast. Oh, it's really fast. Um, it's scary fast, actually. It's, right. it's rated to 50 miles per hour, which is uh, which is really cool, but pretty spooky at the yeah. same exact time. Yeah, twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment. On this, sitting on, on this top thing. of it, it's so, terrifying. So we would never go this fast with that amount of, of money on it. 
I just feel like that kind of speed mm -hmm. and you know with with a controller in my hand mm -hmm. and if I go 40 50 miles per hour and I even do a small turn it, yeah. she's gonna flip yeah. I brought it up on two tires going probably 15 20 miles per hour yeah. with a Ronin and the C500 on it it scared me a lot mm -hmm. so again it touts a very high speed is that speed quite applicable I'm not sure and that's the thing too is you know we talked about the tires before right that would also play a really big sure you know play in that because I mean plastic rims that go in you know even past 20 miles an hour in my opinion it gets risky sure. you get risk of if I mean if the risk would cr if the rim were to crack and the tire would come off the car itself is one thing but you got twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment sure. it's definitely a scary feeling if some of the, the the structural issues on this car can be improved and shored up then I think that that can greatly minimize that, that yeah. last point so I'm gonna give this from a piloting standpoint and from when we put it into post I'm gonna give this about seven stars that's really it for me so what do you think Gil? For me now again I controlled more the gimbal um, but the result of the car being and having the things that it has resulted in the gimbal having some issues that it normally doesn't have. I said seven out of ten as well because of a lot of the things that you said when it came to this, even the steering. All those things that you talked about, the having to make those minor adjustments, not being able to accelerate or slow down at a softer, less aggressive pace, all those things affected the room. It's a great, has great potential. I don't think it could be used in every application. I don't think it's an off-road vehicle, you know, chasing through the woods type of vehicle, but definitely in a controlled setting. Uh, on a, on a harder, soft, uh, harder, more smooth surface, I think it can get uh, get the shots you need. But and I agree, not in one take. Unfortunately, it did take a few takes, and a lot of that was us having to figure out. Like for example, like I talked about before, sh driving forward while shooting backwards. That definitely helped. Definitely yeah. helped out a lot, which was surprising. It wasn't intentional that we did it that way to make it smoother. It was just this way we were shooting it, but it worked out. Um, so I think the more you you know you play around with it and customize some of the things on it and definitely fix the things we talked about, I think overall it's 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 definitely it's a great RC product. It's definitely in the midst of pioneering the yes. RC gimbal car. Yes. You know? Because it could definitely give you options with a lighter budget, sure. with things that say you don't have the higher budget for the sure. you know more advanced rigs. Sure. Definitely gives you those options, but those options can't be met and, and available until those things are fixed. And, and this, um, for my. Well, we hope you like this review. Um, thank you very much, Cindy Gears, for sending this and allowing us to do it. And uh, again, it's a fantastic car. I, I think it has a lot of applications in the film industry and in the TV industry as well. Yeah. So if you like this video, please comment, like, and subscribe. I'm Gil, and this is Chris. Thanks for watching.